Hi, my name is Tom Statler, and I work at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., where I'm the program scientist for the DART mission. The DART mission is humanity's first attempt to change the motion of a celestial body. And the reason we're doing this is to test our ability to protect the Earth from an impact by an asteroid if we should ever discover in the future an asteroid that is headed on a collision course for Earth. Planetary defense is about making sure that a rock from space doesn't send us back to the Stone Age. And the key parts of planetary defense are, first of all, finding the asteroids that are potentially hazardous to the Earth. And we understand where about 40% of those asteroids are. We know that no known asteroid is a danger to the Earth right now. But the concern is about the asteroids we don't know about yet. And if we should ever discover an asteroid that's on a collision course with Earth, we want to be able to discover this years in advance so we can give the asteroid a push, not to destroy it, we probably wouldn't be able to do that anyway, but just to prevent that collision. And the DART mission, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, is our first test of one way of doing that. DART's going to a binary asteroid, a double asteroid, for two really good reasons. The little asteroid, Dimorphos, which is in orbit around the big asteroid, Didymos, that asteroid is about the size of object that we would, we would tend to be concerned about. The most abundant asteroids are the small ones. And this one, about 160 meters across, or about the size of a football stadium, is large enough that it really would cause severe damage if it struck the Earth. Now, by impacting by doing our experiment, a kinetic impact experiment on the small moonlit asteroid, we're able to measure our effectiveness in deflecting the asteroid by watching the change in the orbit of the little asteroid around the big one. It makes that measurement a lot more precise and a lot easier to do with telescopes on Earth. The other reason we're doing it is that the presence of the large asteroid there keeps the little one in orbit around it as the pair go around the sun. So that means that this asteroid, which is not a danger to Earth now, will never become a danger to the Earth because of anything that we do in the DART mission. No asteroid that we know of now is a danger to the Earth. And the Didymos, Didymos asteroid that DART is going to, that also is not a danger to the Earth. And there's nothing that we could do to it that will make it a danger to the Earth. But the possibility of an asteroid large enough that it could affect huge numbers of people, uh, the, the likelihood of that happening during our lifetimes is there. It's not a high probability, but uh, we take precautions about low probability events all the time. It's a low probability that your house will burn down, for example, but you take precautions to make sure that that doesn't happen and you have fire insurance. Anyone who wants to know about DART can follow on social media by using the hashtag DART mission or by looking at nasa.gov slash DART mission. At the moment of impact with Dimorphos, DART will be moving at about four miles per second. That's about 15,000 miles an hour. The important thing isn't how far we move the asteroid, it's how much we change its speed by. So we're going to change the speed of the asteroid by only a few millimeters per second. It's far, far smaller than walking speed. But the idea in planetary defense is that if there is a hazardous asteroid, a dangerous asteroid, and we discover it years in advance, then a change in its velocity that tiny, given time to add up, given time to work, <laughs> can make the difference between an impact on Earth and a safe miss.
NASA's planetary defense strategy is to do several things at the same time. The most important one is to search for asteroids because we only know about 40% of the population of asteroids that could be dangerous. And we need to find that other 60%, track them, establish their orbits around the sun and figure out which ones could be dangerous to us now or in the future. Also, like in the DART mission, we wanna develop the technologies for deflecting asteroids, mitigating the effects of the asteroid hazard. And then we wanna be working with other federal agencies, state and local governments and governments worldwide uh, to understand how the worldwide community can deal with this issue of planetary defense and protect the entire world, share information, transmit up, uh, information up the chain to the decision makers, do what's necessary to respond to an actual asteroid danger if there is, ever is one. DART is carrying a small CubeSat. It's called the Leachia Cube. It was contributed by the Italian Space Agency. And its job basically is to watch the impact from a little distance away. It's riding along on the DART spacecraft and it's going to be deployed a few days before the kinetic impact. Uh, it's going to maneuver and offset itself to the side so that it doesn't run into the same asteroid that DART is running into. And it's got two cameras on it that are going to try to first catch the actual impact of DART on camera, but then more importantly, uh, see the ejecta, the plume of material that's blown off the surface of the asteroid and how that develops. If we're fortunate, we'll be able to see the impact crater newly formed by the DART impact. And then of course, Leachia Cube is going to do something that DART can't do, that is fly past the asteroid, look back and get the full three-dimensional shape of the object that we hit, which we won't know until we actually get there. One of my favorite things about DART is the name. It's the double asteroid redirection test. And we're going to a double asteroid. It's a binary asteroid, but we're also doing a double test. DART is a test of our ability to actually execute a kinetic impact, build a spacecraft that can autonomously, autonomously direct itself to, to a collision with an asteroid. But also we have to uh, test how a real asteroid responds to that deflection attempt because it's one thing to take a very expensive spacecraft and smash it to bits on the surface of an asteroid. But really the question we wanna answer is how effectively do we move an asteroid when we do that? So DART is a double test on a double asteroid. Well, hello, everybody. This is Scott Roberts and Daniel Barth here at, um, at uh, uh, Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance on the 36th episode of How Do You Know? And this particular program is what happens when asteroids strike. Um, asteroids uh, uh, have been, uh, uh, you know, have dealt incredible uh, devastating blows to our planet, but uh, could be also part of the reason why uh, we're here uh, to uh, you know to watch uh, asteroids and track them and uh, possibly do something about them if they are to strike Earth again. So, uh, which is not an if, but more or less a when. So, um, <laughs> so what do you think there, Dan? Well, you know, it's a it's a fascinating subject, Scott, and uh, we were we were talking last time about uh, watching the Chelyabinsk meteor uh, yeah. on video and saying how we would have liked to have been there, <laughs> even if we got a little bit beat yeah, up yeah. in the process. Oh, don't touch no, it. I, you know, I want to be, be the Max L guy with my tie being blown behind me, not by a good pair of speakers, but by, uh, <laughs> by yeah. a, a meteor shockwave. That would be awesome. So deep, yeah. Um, yeah. I agree. I would, I would give some skin. To, to witness sure. that. I really would. Sure. And you will. You uh, will give probably it. give a fair amount, a fair percentage of hearing loss to witness that as well. But, you know, this is a price of discovery. That's right. Well, one of the things that uh, I come across in my research is, and uh, it's kind of interesting, we all tweak our, our little news preferences on our, 
on our media sources and our phones and everything these days. And mine are, are heavily tilted towards physics, astronomy, uh, and, uh, and uh, archaeology and paleontology. Yes. Kind of weird intersecting. And uh, something came up in a few weeks, a few months ago. And uh, it was about a meteor impact. And as I was mentioning to you before the show, Scott, uh, I, everybody knows here that I, I taught astronomy for many years. One of the resources that I used, remember that when I was teaching this, there were no, there were no textbooks uh, for the most part. You had to kind of make up your curriculum as you went along. One of the things that I used was uh, Fred Schaff's book, The Starry Room, which I, I recommend. It's a, it's a very good read. It's a very easy read, lots of fun. One of the things he talks about there is going out to watch meteors. And he says, let's talk about impactors. And Fred Schaff proceeds to talk about impactors from basically grains of cosmic dust right on up through the dinosaur killer. And when you're talking a dinosaur killer, the 10 mile rock from space, uh, that really is kind of a tuck your head between your knees and kiss your bottom goodbye sort of a day. It's a, it's a bad day for everybody on earth. And it's one of these extinction level events that they talk about where a large percentage of species on the earth are going to perish in a single event. Hmm. But below that, people think, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the everything, everybody dies scenario. But what happens if it's just a little bit smaller than that? And we talk about things like uh, the Tunguska event that happened in Siberia in 1908 and the Behringer meteor crater. Scott, you and I have both been there. Sure. And the Behringer crater is about a kilometer across, uh, about half a kilometer deep, roughly. It has the volume of about 400 uh, professional football stadiums, and it was excavated in about two seconds. You think about, and this was supposed to be about a 100 meter impactor, give or take. Uh, they believe it was an iron impactor, an iron uh, meteor, asteroid. And this thing came in, and when it struck the ground, that's a fairly, that's a very flat area. You realize it came in almost vertically and the blast would have deflected out sideways and nothing within 25 to 30 kilometers would have survived. It would have, the blast wave would have basically stripped the ground bare. And you're talking about the ejecta material being blasted out at hypersonic speeds and uh, just scouring the ground to rock. At the time, it was a it was a fairly wet place, but the ground under the rock underneath was quite quite hard, and uh, this kind of an impactor. And we think, oh yeah, well, that was 50, 60,000 years ago, and it's very much like, oh well, we know that was a long time ago, and perhaps it won't ever happen. Uh, and you and I, Scott, have seen famous. I heard in this little video clip you played lots of yeah. famous last words. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure we know all the really dangerous ones. We know all the big things now. And uh, we're, we're really sure we're looking for the little things. Um, we, that's hubris, just plain old hubris. Uh, the Chelyabinsk meteor, which was a half a megaton explosion, 500 kilotons. Uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki in the 15 to 20 kiloton range. This thing was 500 kilotons and it was an airburst. It blew up about 30 kilometers up and it was traveling kind of at a glancing blow, it was traveling almost parallel to the ground when it blew up. So most of the shock would have went out into the atmosphere rather than down into the ground. Change the orientation of the Chelyabinsk by about 60 degrees. So it's coming more straight down, more of that force and energy and heat would have been directed toward the ground instead of mm -hmm. into the air. And then you would have had basically a city that would have been a smoking ruin. And that's the story we're going to tell you today. And we're gonna talk about some of these impactors, the famous ones. Uh, Tunguska, Scott, 1908. And they know the exact day, June 30th, 
1908. So it's kind of interesting. They know, and it was the time, they know at the time, it was a fairly early morning event, about 7 a.m. local time. And this was a 100 to 250 uh, meter, Im meter impactor. Uh, so something the size of a 10 to 20 story building, uh, right. a fairly uh, quite large building. And uh, this struck out in an uninhabited area or very sparsely inhabited area in Siberia. And yeah, there were some relatively uh, primitive living people out there at the time, uh, hunter gatherers, hunters, fishermen, uh, trappers, but that area of Siberia was basically uninhabited at the time. And this impactor would have been about a 12, they estimated about 12 megatons. This was in such a remote area, Scott, no one yeah. got there. No one went out to investigate it for 19 years. It was just, and you're saying, well, there's this huge explosion, oh my gosh. And it, this thing caused climate change. The climate change from Tunguska lasted uh, three to four years. The sound wave was heard around the world. And we had an event on that order just recently. The, uh, uh, I'm gonna get the name badly wrong here. The Tongahunga volcano in the archipelago in the South Pacific, and this thing blew up, kaboom. And uh, the, so the shock waves circled the globe several times. The plume of ash went up into the uh, mesosphere. So it went up something like 50 kilometers high. This thing wow. is, it was blasting debris high enough where the, and obviously it's aerosol and microparticles at that height but that's high enough to affect satellites. If you have low flying satellites, that's uh, bad enough to affect them. Um, but this, uh, this Tunguska blast, when they did send people out, one of the things they were stunned, they said, well, what happened? There wasn't a crater. People would think, oh, there has to be a crater. There has to be some kind of smoking yeah. caldera in the ground. There was nothing, but it's in an area of permafrost. And we see evidence of impacts like this on Mars, what they call splotch craters, where it was an area where there's a lot of ice and a lot of in the topsoil and the impact hit it and you see waves and ripples and looks like mud floats blasted along. But this is an area of permafrost. So like the icy moons of Jupiter, uh, like uh, Enceladus, and Europa don't show, they're very smooth. Why? Because the ice relaxes and it doesn't, it doesn't take and hold evidence of geological type impacts like that very well. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did find <laughs> was a forest which was basically knocked down. And there are photographs of this from the 1920s when people went out there finally. And you see trees which are knocked flat and they were all knocked flat in a radial pattern. Think of setting up a big array of di uh, dominoes on a floor, a big circular array of dominoes, putting a firecracker in the middle. They would all be blown down radial to the explosion. And these trees, some, many of them were burnt on the top, intact on the bottoms, and they were all blown out as if from a central explosion. This puzzled everybody. They said, oh, if it was an impactor, eh, there would be a crater. There was none. There was speculation that it was a comet fragment. But in fact, what you had, Scott, was an airburst. When something this size, 100, 200, 300 meters, hits the Earth's atmosphere, people don't realize as the air gets compressed in front of the incoming asteroid, the air reaches a density comparable to steel. <laughs> and so essentially this wall of air pressure can't push the air out fast enough. Keep in mind, you're talking an impactor moving 30, 40, 50,000 uh, kilometers an hour, orbital speeds. It can't push the air out of the way. It runs into the air as if it's a solid wall and the impactor will crumble and detonate. And when it explodes from this pressure, basically it's being compressed from both sides. It has the momentum pushing it this way and the air pushing that way. And it basically, it fractures and explodes. This size meteor, the Tunguska size meteor would have basically vaporized. 
So you're talking now something the size of a large office building and it vaporizes. And you know, we, when they talked about the DART impact that they said, oh, we can't destroy an asteroid. Well, we might be able to, but that doesn't solve our problem because it doesn't change the mass and it doesn't change the momentum. And so this Tunguska, this thing weighing uh, many thousands of tons, probably millions of tons, and it vaporizes and all this material is still plunging downward almost vertically. And by this time it's moving, oh, only a couple of times the speed of sound. So uh, a couple of thousand miles an hour. And the uh, compression, of course, pressure creates heat. And so when the Tunguska asteroid broke up and hit the ground as vapor, you're talking temperatures in the two to 5,000 Celsius and the impactor comes down and it's like, it's like uh, shooting a fire hose at uh, a concrete roadway and it hits and it splatters out in all directions. And this force is redirected. It's not big enough to substantially penetrate the earth's surface or the earth's crust. So all of this material simply hits and gets redirected out radially. And when you think about that, you're like, wow, all this energy goes from straight down to out radially. Well, first of all, this distributes all the force. Think, of, think about a bullet and then redirecting all the force out. Well, <clears throat> uh, this force was enough to destroy about over 2,000 square kilometers. That's uh, 850, 900 square miles. 900 square miles, you're talking about the area of a county. You know, you're not talking about the area of a city like Los Angeles uh, or Tokyo. You're talking about the area of a county. And everything inside that area, the impact and the heat flash you're gonna get the, uh, the light first and then the heat and then the shock wave, uh, depending on where you are, some seconds later. And then followed by that, you get the rain of debris. <laughs> and uh, I suspect that rather like uh, being in a tornado or a hurricane, it's not the force of the wind that kills you, it's the things that are airborne that wipe you out. Uh, you know, you, you hear stories and you've seen photos where a tree stump has been, a tree has been blown through a house, like an arrow through a target. Uh, and it's the incredible airspeed picking up materials uh, that does the most damage. Uh, I do recall as a boy uh, going to my grandfather's farm and out in the garage, there was a, there was a plank, like a one by six plank. And there's about 15 or 20 chicken feathers pounded through it like nails. And I asked my grandpa and he said, ask your dad. And I asked my dad and he says, oh, there was a tornado. This is the only thing we found from the chicken house. It was up in a tree. I climbed up the tree to go get it. And all these feathers were through it like nails. And that's all we found of the chickens. And he said, you realize the wind blew the feathers so fast and so hard that they punched through this one by six plank. And yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, it's, it's just stunning the things that high velocity debris can do. Uh, people at the time who were about 100 kilometers, 100, 150 kilometers away from Tunguska, and they said there was this blinding meteor, and we always wondered what that would look like, and then Chelyabinsk happened, and if you go to YouTube, friends, and you look up Russian meteor or Chelyabinsk meteor, and there's loads of video of it. Uh, Russians are very fond of their dash cams. So there's whole lots of dash cam videos and uh, there's lots of security camera videos and all sorts of things. Uh, so we see this meteor go across the sky. <clears throat> there's this meteor. They said there was a flash brighter than the sun, a billowing cloud, and then a pillar of fire. Hmm. So you think straight down and it goes up. It must have been rather like a mushroom cloud. I suspect had more modern people seen this, they would have said, oh, it looked like a nuclear strike. 
The yeah. heat would have gone up. You would have created this mushroom cloud. And then they said the shock wave came. And 50, 70, 100 kilometers away, you're talking about walls being blown down, windows being blown out, people being knocked off their feet. And again, more than 2,000 square kilometers of forest just being knocked down and, uh, you know, terrible, terrible damage. And the Chelyabinsk meteor, Scott, was not that big. They hmm. think it was in the 20 to 25 meter, meter class. So this would have been something the size of a small home. Uh, or if you prefer a semi tractor trailer, right? Not the, like the rig, but the trailer house. would have been about the right size. Yeah. Uh, half megaton airburst. 1,500 people were hurt, mostly by flying glass and debris. Right. Uh, nobody was killed. Nobody I know of. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody who was killed. Uh, there was a one building right near uh, Ground Zero is a factory where the walls and the ceiling collapse. And uh, fortunately, at the time, it was about 7 a.m. Nobody was there. And mm -hmm. uh, so nobody died. Miracle, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, sure. And uh, then there's one most many people don't know, but it's there's a whole class of meteorites named for it. It's the, and I'm going to massacre this name. My apologies to our Russian-speaking viewers. Uh, Sakot Alin. And I'm sure I'm doing Shikotalin. it justice. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I've always heard it pronounced Shakota Lynn. Shakota but Lynn, there you go. There might be a different emphasis on different parts of that word. Who knows? I will have to, I will have to plead, uh, <laughs> plead ignorance and hope somebody can help me. This was near the city of Vladivostok in 1947, right after World War II. You can imagine the people <laughs> that must have thought that, oh my God, uh, it's happening again. Uh, again, you have this very bright meteor trailing a cloud of smoke. It wasn't airburst. And this thing was a stony meteorite. It wasn't, it left more than 120 secondary craters in and around the area. Uh, hundreds of tons of fragments. And some of the bigger craters were 30 meters, which would be big enough to swallow a house. Thank you very much. Again, in this area, it hit most of the impactors hit in a forested area outside the city of Vladivostok, and lots of forest animals were dead. Yeah, there was lots of wildlife was just mowed down, both by the impactors themselves and by uh, blast and ejecta material, and lots of animals dead, lots of forest area damaged, but uh, again, Dodge the bullet. Why it was mostly horizontal. It's reported as coming in at about uh, 45 or 50 degrees. Again, a more vertical impact is more deadly because the force is more directed to a specific point. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have these things and they, they do happen. And uh, we talk about, and we should, we should, we should be looking for these things out in space. We do, and we need to have uh, observational programs that are going to detect these things and look for them. But um, there are monsters in the dark and it doesn't have to be a very, very big monster. Something like the Chelyabinsk impactor, 20 to 50 meters, that's a really small thing. If you're going hunting for asteroids with a telescope, Scott, you're looking at things that are half a kilometer and bigger because these things are about the color of blacktop, <laughs> very low albedo. <clears throat> they don't reflect very much, certainly not in visible light. They're brighter in infrared, but these things can sneak up on us. And if we're going to do something like the DART mission to protect ourselves, we need to detect this and say, oh, you know what? Five years from now, this thing's going to be swooping around and we and it are going to be in the same place at the same time. If we have five years lag time, we can, we can probably develop one or more dart type missions and you don't have to deflect it very much. The farther away the bullet is, the less of a, of a deflection that it takes so that it just misses you instead of drilling you, right? So 
We don't need a very big change, friends. A few millimeters per second is plenty. Uh, as long as it misses us, if it passes, oh, 100 miles off the starboard bow, so to speak, it's fine. It doesn't hurt anybody. But if, it, if it's uh, on track to hit us, the more time, the more glide time we have, the better we'll do. This brings us around to uh, archaeology, strangely, and the city of Tal el Hammam. And uh, this is an Arabic name for a city. Again, I'm sure I'm doing the pronunciation badly, forgive me. Uh, Tal el Hammam is believed to be the biblical city of Sodom. And many of our viewers would have heard of this, this story. Uh, it's an old Bible story from the Old Testament. Uh, God was God's wrath and rained down on the city and uh, destroyed it in a pillar of fire. And uh, Lot's wife looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. Well, they believe now they have found the biblical city of Sodom, which is nowadays known, it's in Jordan, and it's known as Tal El Hammam, which basically means Tal is big hill. So it's a big mound settlement. And uh, we know now that El Hammam would have been a Bronze Age settlement. It would have flourished from about 4700 BC until it was destroyed about 1650 BC. And again, these dates are, you know, they're as good as we can get with archaeology, but we don't have a calendar and we don't have any eyewitnesses. Uh, this was a very large city, Bronze Age. So they had bronze, they had copper tools. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. It requires forging technology, it requires you to be able to generate a heat of around uh, five to 700 Celsius. And uh, it was a massive walled city, a fortress city. It was uh, the biggest city in the uh, Southern Levant at the time. And uh, I looked and looked and I couldn't find any estimates for the population of a place like this, but it could have been some tens of thousands of people who lived there. And like any of these trade route centers, people would have been in and out all the time. Uh, caravans and other things would have brought people and goods in and out all the time. Um, the city site is over 100 acres of buildings and structures. To give you an idea, 100 acres is about the size of one of our large uh, university campuses. And uh, extensive field works and evidence of uh, agriculture uh, extending far beyond that outside the city, a city this big needs to be self-supporting in foodstuffs. And so they would have had animal husbandry and farming and all sorts of industry like this. Um, but El Hammam died one day, no warning. And we talk about an impactor. This we believe would have been larger than Tunguska. We're talking about something in the 200 to 500 meter class. So 200 meters, we can think of that as, oh, that's a football stadium. 500 meters, that's half a kilometer, more than a quarter mile. We're talking a very big hill. And uh, there's no evidence that this was an angled impact. So we don't see evidence that the impact was fan-shaped or anything like that. Uh, it seemed to be pretty much a dead-on burst. Was it a true 90-degree impactor? Probably no way to know that, uh, at least not with our current technology. But uh, we believe this came in and there was an airburst probably about uh, 10 to 15 kilometers up. And we think about 10 to 15 kilometers that, ooh, that's quite a long way away. That would be a, that would be a substantial walk. But when you're going 30,000 kilometers an hour, 10 kilometers is nothing. It's nothing. <laughs> nothing. Uh, you know, the blink of an eye. We yeah. think, we think, Scott, this would have been something on the order of a 20 to 50 megaton explosion. Not kiloton, megaton. Megatons. Uh, the largest like bomb a we modern, ever set off. High, was, very volatile nuclear bomb yes, today. Um, the like, Ivy Mike experiment, which was a nuclear, it was a thermonuclear detonation in the South Pacific 
that was about 15 megatons. That island isn't there anymore. Uh, and the, uh, the Soviets set off something called the Tsar Bomba. And the oh, Tsar yeah. Bomba uh, would have been 50 megatons. So it would have been about this size. Uh, I, will, I will show everybody, this is an artist's conception. And uh, I, I think it's not a good conception. I think it would have been a worse day than this. They're showing the, uh, oh, the yeah, bright flash from the impactor and the, uh, the column of uh, smoke and things. I think by the time that smoke reaches the ground, the shock wave has already hit. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, all. and this is a, this is a representation of what we think El Hamam looked like. They had this multi-story uh, palace structure in the center, uh, a lot mm -hmm. of adobe brick. So we're talking mud bricks, and uh, we're talking pottery. They would have had ceramics. They would have had fired pottery. They would have had implements made out of tin and copper and bronze. Bronze, the hardest metal they could make, would have been reserved for weapons and perhaps uh, stone shaping tools uh, for sculpture or masonry. And uh, the buildings would have been reinforced with timbers uh, running through, much like uh, many people have seen uh, adobe structures from Native Americans in the southwest of the United States, where there are timbers that run through and they use that to support the mud brick structures. And so when you had this, this event, Scott, it would have been, um, it would have been a, a pretty, pretty bad day. Um, but if there's any mercy in this, the people of El Hamam wouldn't have known a thing about it. Um, the excavation evidence shows pieces of pottery where the outside surface has melted into glass and then boiled. Yikes. So, and you, you, they think that the, the peak temperatures would have been 20 to 30 seconds before it starts cooling down. So in 20 seconds, the surface of the pottery melted into glass and then the glass boiled. You're talking about mud bricks, right? Melt and boil. What is that? Is that magma? I'm not sure. It certainly was within the temperature range. Uh, metal implements melted and withered like flowers under a blowtorch. They have evidence of like spears and things that just melted and withered uh, like flowers on a, on a dry, hot day. Temperatures at the core of the impact estimated over 2000 Celsius, 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And the archaeologists were very puzzled because they found there's this almost two meter thick layer where everything is burnt. Everything is burnt. And they're like, oh my gosh. And they're seeing this evidence of melted adobe brick, molten glass, melted pottery, melted bronze. Yeah, this just wasn't a citywide fire. This was. Yeah. yeah. Was, and um, this two meter deep layer has carbonized things. It has shocked quartz grains. Shocked quartz grains, friends, require something like 1600 PSI. I'm not sure how many kilopascals that is. I think the uh, metric prefix is LATSA. <laughs> You're just talking about unreal pressures, unreal temperatures. Uh, there's evidence of tectites, basically pieces of molten material which fly out and then form spheres because of surface tension, there's iron tectites. There is no source of iron. They didn't have iron. It would have been simply iron material in the soil, in the sand. Uh, silica tectites, the, the sand turning into glass and little balls of glass. Uh, and for many kilometers around this site, um, yeah, this I mean, airburst. even that, even those things are deadly. I mean, you know, if you somehow magically survived the impact and yeah. then, you know, this rain of tectites starts coming down. Yeah, you're, uh, you're talking one centimeter spheres of yeah, white coming hot from the stratosphere, glass iron. Yeah, hot molten glass, uh, yeah. moving at bullets coming down, sonic basically. or hypersonic speeds, and yeah, right through you like a rifle bullet. 
Um, this city, El Hammam, was about seven miles from the mouth of the Jordan River where it empties into the Dead Sea. Um, this airburst disrupted the Dead Sea. First, there's the shock. The Richter scale impact would have been eight, nine. And so I you would have had huge waves. And after the impact, there's a lot of heat, which is going to create a huge updraft. This updraft drew, I don't know, some cubic kilometers of water from the Dead Sea up into the air and rained it down on this entire region. Well, what basically they did, you've heard about the, uh, the Roman techniques of the assaulting the earth, right? Walking through, if we can't have this land, you won't either. And so they would spread salt in the field so it wouldn't grow crops. The Al Hammam impactor drew all this water up from the Dead Sea, the saltiest body of water on the earth or close to it. And it oh, rained down this very salty water. Good. Uh, yeah. several times more higher salinity than seawater and rained it down on this ground. In the vicinity of El Hammam, no one was able to grow crops for 600 years because of the salt in the soil. Nothing would grow. You talk about the biblical story of Lot and the pillars of salt. I imagine when the water dried, Sometimes when you have very salty airs, you do see little columns of salt forming. And I'm sure they saw a lot of these things. And mm. this is a desert region, as we all know. Mm. And so had it been somewhere in a, in a wet area, the rain would have washed the salt out of the soil much quicker. But because of this desert area, no one was able to go back and recolonize this area for centuries. Nothing would grow. It was just a desolation. It would have been like a moonscape. Mm. Um, the other thing they had, there was another city called Aqaba Jabbar, and I'm sure I'm slaughtering that. Today, we know it as the modern city of Jericho. It was about 40 kilometers away. The airburst comes down, it flattens out, and the, uh, the airburst shockwave destroyed the walls of the city of Jericho. Again, another biblical story of a prophet who came with a trumpet and the noise was so great, boom, it laid flat the walls. And people have always said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, no, it really happened. Uh, and we, we see these things today and we go, golly, uh, were these tales, they would have created stories that would have been told and retold in the cultures surrounding this area for hundreds of years, a millennia. This is a millennia or more before uh, any of the books of the Old Testament were written. And yet these biblical stories of disaster, and uh, they interpreted it as many primitive societies would, the gods are angry. Somebody's really mad at us. And uh, the stories of the destruction of Sodom and the walls of Jericho were probably one event that we can date to about uh, 1600 years BC before Christ and uh, about 30, these would have been things that uh, the Pharaohs would have known about. Uh, they, I'm sure they would have heard of these things. The tales of this, there used to be this city, this big city, and we went there with our trade caravan and there's nothing there. It's all burnt, it's a smoking ruin. And you know what? For miles around, nothing's growing anymore. It used to be this big agriculture, nothing's growing there. Uh, what happened? We don't know. Um, there may have been some people in Jericho who witnessed this and saw it and survived it. We have no written records of the time. But uh, I'll leave our, uh, our folks with this uh, tale of this asteroid, the uh, 2022 AE1 about a one kilometer impactor. We detected this and we found, ooh, there's this big rock. And they predicted an impact earth crossing uh, event around the 4th of July, 2023, and realized this is a 2022. So one year out, no time to deflect it. We don't have a standing dark type mission on the pad, ready to fuel and launch. Uh, we could not have deflected this and uh, we rated it 
there's a scale. Of course, there's a scale for this it's called the Torino scale uh, or the Palermo scale. Mm -hmm. And basically, they rate these impactors and they go, oh, well, if it's between negative, if it's less than negative two on this particular scale, it means eh, nobody's worried about that. <coughs> From negative two to zero, that means it's a pretty good chance it might hit us. And so it's a concern. <coughs> Values above zero are a problem. That's a bad day. They first, uh, AE1, its first value was about 1.5. And people were like, ooh, this is not good. And uh, then they were trying to track the orbit, but then it was in waxing moon. So the moon was too bright. They couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. And so uh, it took them about a week and everybody was kind of biting their nails. And then they were able to see it and go, oh, okay, this is, this is harmless. And there's there's no reason to worry. And we've got some links on today's download, Scott, for people. But uh, just show folks um, a couple more fun pictures before we go. Here's the uh, here's a view of some of this pottery. And it shows the inside and the outside of uh, pottery and uh, things that they found near the palace. And here's some tectites and different things that you're seeing this material is it's boiling this is like a clay pot like terracotta and you see that it's boiling and you go oh my gosh this is terrible and uh here's the uh <coughs> picture of some of the uh clay layers and different things from the uh wood and materials that were used to go ahead and uh show this and they're showing how they, they built this city with straw and clay and they're showing, oh gosh, yeah, this stuff was all fused and melted. It was indeed a very bad day in the Levant. And we need to be aware, we need to, uh, we need to talk to our legislators, convince them, write them, say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm an educated citizen and there's these things and I would like you to support them. You should support yeah. asteroid defense, planetary defense. Uh, we, we see the, the terrible news that's coming out of the Ukraine-Russian border, and we realize, um, yeah, you know, MiGs are going to do nothing. Our best, our best uh, offensive weapons are going to do nothing. Nukes will not avail us. Uh, we need some sort of planetary defense, because if we're talking about this sort of an invader, uh, it's relentless, it's mindless. <laughs> and yeah. frankly, Scott, and, and I'll, I'll add that we should be collectively as a planet, we should be spending our money and our minds and our technology towards those Indeed. things, you know, instead of something this size, up. <laughs> something this size is a city killer. And of course, yeah. the earth is three quarters water. And you think, oh, well, if it strikes the ocean, it's no problem. If it's within 100 kilometers of a, of a seashore, it's a problem. That's a tsunami like we've never seen. Uh, and of course, if it strikes on land, yeah, there's places like Antarctica and Siberia and uh, the wilderness area in Alaska, but uh, sometimes cities are at the bullseye. And when they are in this sort of a situation, cities die. Uh, the death toll for a strike like this, uh, even over a, a city like where Lilo, the Bentonville, Fayetteville metro area, the death toll would be in the hundreds of thousands. That's true. And the environmental damage that's would human be catastrophic. Death toll. It's yeah. going to also wipe out animals and oh yes, oh yes, there are there are well, regional species that would be wiped out, yeah. and something like this would affect global climate for as much as a decade. And the kind of shroud, <laughs> which uh, we have a nuclear winter type scenario. Lowers temperatures, reduces crop yields, hunger, people die. People die who may be half a world away from hunger because no summer, no crops, no food, bad day. So, <laughs> excuse me. I promise next week we'll have a happier topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I do remember uh, being at the... Um, uh, the movie premiere for Deep Impact uh, yes. 
And uh, I got to sit next to Donald Yeomans, who is JPL's guru of uh, orbital, you know, uh, calculations. And right. uh, he was the technical advisor for the film of Deep Impact. If you saw the movie, you saw these terrific um, tidal waves, yes. uh, the giant blasts, and all the rest of these things. Um, I asked him while I was sitting next to him, I said, so what's the likelihood of, you know, something like this happening? He says, well, he said, it's not if, but it's when. And he says, and the other thing that made it kind of creepy was he said, whatever, you know, whenever, whenever the next time is it's on its way now, you know, and, uh, and we don't know where it is. It's out there. It's kind of like that. So these pro-am projects that are out there um, uh, to watch asteroids uh, with the amateur Indeed. telescopes are very, very important, important you know, very, very important. Learning more about uh, asteroids and especially the potentially hazardous uh, asteroids, those are of intense interest. And uh, we do have more eyes on the sky than ever and we, we should put them to use. So. Um, you know, and I do believe that uh, uh, projects like the DART program will uh, be a, you know, although it's a baby step, it will be an important step towards it protecting is our planet. Very much so. Yep. Well, great, right. uh, Daniel. Thank you very much. That was that was a. Uh, I I am interested in this subject very much as well, and uh, um, you know, uh, as dangerous as uh, asteroids have been, uh, they they're probably an important link towards life anyways forming on our planet and uh um so you know you do have to stir up the uh the pot, proverbial pot to uh to make things happen and uh probably between impacts from comets and asteroids a lot of things happened here so indeed um uh, i did want to uh just uh, mention that over the weekend i did visit the oracle state park where the uh, second Arizona deep sky or dark sky star party will uh, occur. And I can attest that it is very dark um, and that the park is beautiful. Uh, if you check out the website for uh, Oracle State Park uh, in Arizona, the photographs don't do it justice. It is, uh, it is a spectacular park and very well manicured. And, um, and the park is uh, opening its, uh, its arms to uh, to host a, a multi-day star party. It will be the first one that they've done that will be multi- multiple days from September 25th or 21st to the 25th. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're really looking forward to it. We have found a location to host the talks. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, if, if it all comes off like we think it might, uh, it could turn into a festival with music um, art and, uh, you know, all of these things, because the whole community is very, very interested in this, you know, and they very much support uh, the wilderness that is Oracle State Park and the fact that it is Arizona's first dark sky park. So, um, so if you want to know more about that, uh, you know, feel free to get back in touch with me, uh, Scott Roberts at s at explorescientific.com. We will be selling tickets here very soon. So, Sounds great. Daniel, thank you very much again for uh, showing up for How Do You Know? Um, Tomorrow, we will not have a Global Star Party because uh, uh, Cesar Brollo is the host of the Global Star Party down in Argentina. And guess what? They're having holidays right now. So today and tomorrow, they are still celebrating. (laughs) And uh, uh, so we have moved Global Star Party to Thursday night this week. Uh, and the special guest host is Cesar Brolo. So, well, good. I'm I can probably attend that. Then it's hard for me during the week because uh, yeah, my day starts at five a.m. <laughs> so it's hard to attend evening events. I look forward like crazy. You to must the be waking up at three three thirty every day. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Well, all right. So thanks, thanks to our audience for watching. It was a, a nice audience. I didn't call out everybody's name, but. Uh, you know, we do very much appreciate you all tuning in and we do. Uh, uh, we'll be back tomorrow with uh, open go to community and um, and uh, on Wednesday, uh, first flight chronicles and then Thursday we'll have on the wing followed by the global star party. OK, so that, that's the deal. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Bye, yeah, everybody. Thank you,
Good night. Thank you.